We uh, are in Mark chapter 12. If you want to open your Bibles to Mark chapter 12, a uh, fair warning. If you have really strong political opinions one way or the other today, you may be offended. I give no apologies for what Jesus says or what's contained in the Word of God. If you're uh, maybe extreme right or extreme left or find yourself in the middle, you might be offended in either way. Uh, and if you have take issue with anything that I say other than what the Scripture says, I'd be happy to engage you after service. <laughs> Just don't throw things at my car or anything like that. But anyway, it's, there's some great lessons here as Jesus uh, tackles what is really a, a disingenuous question, but it gets into issues of taxation. And of course, uh, whenever you're talking about taxation, it's important to kind of look at the broader scope of, of, you know, taxation has to do with our relationship to government. And so it's important to look at those things. Things uh, which the scripture makes really clear as far as Jesus and his position and, you know, the doctrine that we hold on to. So, Father, we pray that you would speak to us. We thank you, God, for what you're doing in our midst. We thank you for our church and uh, just for being together as believers. Thank you for giving us this word and then the, the heart, actually, just the desire to learn from you. Uh, not the things that I have to say, not some philosophy of man, but to hear the things that you would say to us through your word. And so, Holy Spirit, we pray that you would minister to us, pray that we would have hearts that are open to hear what you would say. Bless our time, Lord. May it be profitable to our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so we're picking up here in the midst of chapter 12. We'll begin with uh, verse 13. Con contextually, though, just to kind of remind you where we're at, we're in the last week of Jesus' earthly ministry, things have been escalating over and over again. We see, even in Mark's kind of rapid, rapid pace to, to you know, the, the narration that he gives, things are happening faster and faster and faster. And, and one of the things that we're seeing over and over again is his confrontation with the religious guys, right? They're, they're after, they've been after him for a while. You know, they came last week with this uh, question to his authority. Who gives you the authority to do these things, right? And, and we saw, we're going to see the same thing today. Their question isn't really genuine. It's what we would call a disingenuous question. They don't really want to learn anything from him. And that's just a terrible place to be. I think all of us understand that every once in a while you'll encounter somebody that has a question about, oh, I have a question about Christianity. I have a question about Jesus. I have a question about the Bible. And what they really mean is I want to pick it apart and show you how you're wrong, right? That, that's just the way things are. They're no different from where we're at here. They really aren't genuine in their question, as we will see. Pick up verse 13 here in chapter 12 with me. Then they sent some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to him in order to trap him in a statement. They came and they said to him, teacher, we know that you are a truthful or that you are truthful and defer to no one. For you are not partial to any, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay a poll tax to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or not pay? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why are you testing me? Bring me a denarius to look at. They brought one. And he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they were amazed at him. They were amazed. Over and over we see this, right? With his teaching, it doesn't really matter who's listening. When he presents these things, it's just like, Oh, dang. Right, because he's, he's got total wisdom. He's not like us. You know, if you enter into a political discussion with somebody, you're in trouble. You know you're in trouble the minute you open your mouth. Right, because you can't even figure it out. As human beings, we try to figure it out from all different angles. We try to answer these things, and it's just like, uh, I don't know. There's so many moving parts and pieces, it's hard, hard for us to have wisdom for all these things. 
but he has wisdom for all things. And so when they come to him with what is, at the end of the day, a political question trying to trap him, he knows exactly what to say. To the point where they're just like, ah, dang. We can't, we can't get this guy. Now, this is, as we look at the, the, the alliance here between the Herodians and the Pharisees, it's what I would just call an un likely evil alliance. I say evil, not because the people are necessarily evil, although they're sinners, right? It's an evil alliance because these people have nothing to do with each other. They're not friends. They don't agree on stuff. And their alliance is only temporary, and its only purpose is so that they could come together and together try to trap Jesus. It's like, just imagine in our world, and, I, and, and I'll be careful, I'm going to tiptoe a lot this morning, but just imagine in our world, if you took, if you took some extreme right wing, whatever that would be, some right wing, right wing thinking people, even, you know, what the other side would call radicals, and we took that group, and then we paired it up with a left, left, left group, whatever that might be. Again, I'm tiptoeing, I don't want to offend anybody, but if you took those people, they have nothing to do with each other. They're not going to get along, right? They're going to be totally polar opposites. They're going to disagree about everything. Ah, but for this purpose, for this purpose, they'll get together. Because their common purpose is to get Christ, is to trap, is to trick, is to somehow catch him in some political thing where they could say, aha, you're a bad guy. The Herodians were the ones that supported the family of Herod as well as the Romans who gave them authority to rule. The Pharisees resented Roman rule and considered the Herod clan to be evil usurpers to the throne of David. After all, Herod was an Edomite and not a Jew. The Pharisees opposed the poll tax that the Romans had inflicted on Judea. They despised the very presence of Rome in their land. So these guys, they, politically, they're totally different. And yet, here they are in an unlikely evil alliance. And together, as they come to Jesus, like I said, they have no desire to actually learn. You have to be really careful when you're engaging people like this. People will have questions. They'll, they'll come to you with this, some kind of a question like this, and it's a, they're trying to bait you. We all know what that feels like. It's terrible. You have to be careful to avoid those kinds of things that would only detract from the gospel. They would only detract from the things that we actually want to communicate. Their motive, clearly, from the text, is to trap him in a political debate. And so they come with flattery. Who's a flatterer in our culture? Politicians are always flatterers. I, I know this dates me, but I just think of one character. My, that's a lovely dress you have on today, Mrs. Cleaver. <laughs> All the older people get that. Eddie Haskell, right? You guys remember Eddie Haskell? He's like that classic friend of Wally and the Beef. He's always, you know, brown nosing. He's a flatterer. He's like, he was a terrible character. <laughs> Why, thank you, Eddie. There's a story told of a man named Francois Fenelon. Fenelon. He was the court preacher to King Louis XIV of France in the 17th century. One Sunday when the king and his attendants arrived at the chapel for regular service, no one else was there but the preacher. King Louis demanded, what does this mean? And Fenelon replied, I had published that you would not come to church today in order that your majesty might see who serves God in truth and who flatters the king. It's kind of an interesting little trick. Someone once said the chances are about 10 to 1 that when a man slaps you on the back, he wants you to cough up something. <laughs> and so it's true. Life is... Proven that out, you have to be very careful when some silvery-tongued 
individual comes to you with flattery. I've learned as a pastor, usually the people that are about to stab me in the back come with a compliment first. Oh, pastor, we love you. You're a great, you're a great teacher. And then they're about to tell me why they, they have to leave the church because God's led them to do something else. I've, I know it's like, it's hard to imagine, but I've had it happen more than once. And then find out later, secondhand, that they had some accusation that they held on to, you know. You've got to be careful about flattery. Both in, you know, as far as how we treat other people, you know, don't try to get your way through flattery. And then be careful when other people come to you with flattery. David said, they have counseled only to thrust him down from his high position. They delighted in falsehood. They bless with their mouth, but inwardly they curse. That's the picture of these religious guys, these guys here as they come to Jesus. Oh, we know that you are, you are truthful and you defer to no one. You're not partial to any. You teach the way of God in truth. Now, interestingly enough, they're absolutely right in all of those counts, but they don't really believe it. That's the problem. Everything that they happen to say is totally accurate about Christ, yet we know for certain they do not believe any of that. They despise Jesus. At this point, they're already plotting to kill him. They're liars, they're deceivers. Jesus was not about to be trapped into their discussion. They wanted him to be trapped, but he would not allow it. And so they have what is, again, another one of their disingenuous questions. Is it lawful to pay a poll tax to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or not? Now, if you've been a Christian any length of time, this is really not a debated question. But it was debated for them. It was, it was something that was hotly debated in the day. And, and they wanted to get him involved in this discussion. And the thing is, no matter how he replied to their question in, in the way that they wanted, he was in trouble, either with Rome or Herod or the people. And so what Jesus did in his response to them was he turned the discussion from politics to principle. From politics to principle. And I would just say that is a very wise thing and it's something for us to consider in our day. Where there is a tendency to discuss political things, we should, we should discuss principles. Biblical principles, moral principles. And be careful not to get caught up in wranglings about politics. The truth is, just like these people, we love to complain about taxes, don't we? It's a, it's a national pastime. We love to talk, we love to complain about government. It's easy to do. Can I get an amen? It's, it's just human. It's human, it's been going on forever. No one wants to pay, who wants to, who wants to pay taxes? Are you excited about April 15th, anybody, anyone? And the only people that are excited are the ones that have given too much money to the government all year and then you get yours back like somehow that's a really smart plan. It's not, you know, the, the IRS savings plan is not really brilliant according to tax people, you know. It's like, we don't like to pay taxes. We don't want to pay taxes. We like to complain. We try to avoid paying taxes. There's, there's a massive multi-billion dollar industry all set up to help you try to avoid paying taxes. We think like all people in all, to all times forever that our tax burden is too great. Can I get an amen? amen? The people in Jesus' day felt the same thing. They felt like their tax burden was too great. There was a tax on merchandise. There was a tax on traveling. There was an annual tax on property, one-tenth of all grain, one-fifth of the wine and the fruit grown. It was either actually given with the produce or in the money that came from the produce. There was a tribute or a temple tax on every Israelite 20 years and up. It was what's called the double drachma tax. There was a poll tax on every male, 14 to 65, and women, 12 to 65. 
You think we arrived at that retirement age for Social Security arbitrarily? There it is. God said, you know what? That's okay. 14 to 65 for men, 12 to 65 for, I think I got that backwards, but uh, you know, there's this kind of age group where, yeah, pay the poll tax. It's significant that the Jews raised the question of this particular tax, the one of many taxes, because the poll tax was used to finance the occupying Roman army. Right? We, we understand that. The, the Romans occupied Israel, Palestine. And this was the most hated of all the Roman taxes. As a head tax, it implied that Rome owned not only the land, but the people themselves. That's what's implied by the head tax. And the Jews viewed both themselves and the land as possessions of God. And the rightful ownership of all of it was him. So if Jesus answered no to their question, the Herodians would have brought a charge of sedition. Right? They, they, you know if it had said no. Now, followers of mine don't need to pay the tax. They would have gone right to the officials. This man, and they would later accuse him of that thing. If he said yes, then the Pharisees would accuse him of disloyalty to Israel and to God. And so, you know, they would have stirred up all the people. Oh, he's not really one of us. He's disloyal to our God. He's not partisan. Not partisan enough. You know, I'm going to take it right to the edge over and over and over again. Here's the thing. As he answers, he gets out of answering directly their question, and he said, and instead he poses and he gives to them and to us the principle. We see in Matthew chapter 17, I want you to turn there. We see Jesus tackles this issue repeatedly. We'll see it both in his life, but then later in the New Testament, in the writings of Paul. Turn to Matthew 17. When they came to Capernaum, I'm in verse 24, Matthew 17. When they came to Capernaum, those who collected the two drachma tax came to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the two drachma tax? Evidently, they hadn't paid yet or whatever. He said, yes. Yes. And when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first. There's like just a little nugget in there, right? Jesus wasn't privy to the conversation, but when he came into the house, Jesus knew what he was, was going on outside the house. And so Jesus said to him, what do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth collect customs or poll tax? From their sons or from strangers? When Peter said from strangers, Jesus said to him, then the sons are exempt. However... So that we do not offend them, go to the sea and throw in a hook and take the fish that comes up, or the first fish that comes up, and when you open its mouth, you'll find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for you and me. There's, there's a whole lot in these verses, 24 through 27. There's a whole lot of information. You see the divinity of Christ in that he knew what was going on outside the house, even though he wasn't hearing it directly. He knew what the conversation was. And so he initiates it with Peter. He says, yeah. What's the deal with that? Who pays that tax? Who's liable to pay that tax? And the answer is, not the sons. Why would he say that? Why would he say that? I think he's making the statement, I don't owe taxes to anybody. Right? He wasn't talking about Peter. He's talking about himself. By the way, I'm the king. I'm the son of the king. Do I need to pay taxes? No. The son doesn't pay taxes. Jesus Christ was not obligated to pay tax to man. Amen? He's not. He's just not obligated to pay us anything. Certainly not to the government of men. And so there's an important principle for us to understand. It, he owed nothing to anyone. But we come to verse 27, however, so that we don't offend them. 
He wants to be a good example. He wants Peter to be a good example, and he's teaching Peter to be a good example. He himself is the example. And because of that, what did he do? He paid the tax. Now, I'm certain that this prayer has been prayed over and over again by people. It's tax time. I'm going fishing. It's, a, it's kind of a crazy story, right? It's like, what? Why did, why did Jesus do this? Why did he say, I want you to go fishing? Obviously, it was something that Peter knew how to do. But he says, go fishing. The first fish that comes, I want you to grab that fish. And you know what? The, the tax is going to be paid for. It's going to be right there in the fish's mouth. And then you just go pay it. What is he saying? He's saying, go do something that's insane. Seriously, this isn't how you pay taxes. You don't go fishing to pay taxes. That's what you do for fun. Can I get an amen? Yeah. <laughs> What he's saying is, I want you to trust me. I want you to trust me. That's the, the whole act of doing this is Peter had to just go, it's like, really? Hey, Peter, what are you doing? Well, I'm going fishing because the Lord told me if I go fishing, the first fish I pull out, there's going to be some tax money in there. It's like, really? Yeah. All right. And that's the way it is when we live by faith. We do things that might otherwise be considered kind of goofy or kind of silly. And so the Lord, what does he want to say? He wants to say, listen, do you have trouble paying your taxes? Trust me. Be obedient to me. I'll take care of it. And you know what I've discovered? Year in and year out, he does. And you've probably discovered the same thing. Year in and year out, the Lord God provides for you as Christians. Amen? He just does. And sometimes it's crazy, miraculous way. And other times it's just, hey, maybe you got to, you know, pick up an extra job or sell something or whatever, but the taxes get paid. What Jesus does here beyond all of these other things is he demonstrates his own subservience to the government. Think about that for a second. The Lord of glory. The one to whom we just, we just sang praise songs. We're just thinking about how wonderful the Lord is the Lord of all creation, the God of all creation, the one who made us, he paid a tax. That's subservience. He was subservient to government as an example. I'm going to turn to Romans chapter 13 and we'll see some more of this interaction in the doctrine as Paul lays it out. What ought to be our attitude and our, the attitude of our interaction with government. In Romans chapter 13, Paul says this. Every person, okay, raise your hand if you're a person. <laughs> Point being, he, he, this isn't arbitrary, right? When, what he's about to say doesn't apply to the person next to you, it applies to you, right? It, it, Obviously, it applies to the person next to you. But oftentimes, when we see some instruction, we're thinking about, oh, I wish they would read that. It applies to every one of us who are believers. He's writing this to the church in Rome. And he says, every person is, what? To be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. So he lays this out. This is heavy. This, all of this, as in all the discussions in Romans, is laced with heavy doctrine. This is important doctrine for us to understand. He says, you as a Christian should live your lives, should be in subjection. The word there is the Greek word hupotasso, and it's a military term. It means to line up under, to array under, to get in line. Oh, we don't like that. That just like totally, that chafes, doesn't it? We do not like that. From the moment we're born, we don't like that. And yet he says, be in subjection. To whom? To governing authorities. What? There it is. And he says, why? There's no authority except from God. Those which exist are established by God. Now, many people through the ages would have something to say to Paul about this. They would say something like, what about Hitler? Or what about some, some current, you know, evil empire, whatever it is? The scripture says 
those which exist are established by God. Now, that doesn't make God the author of evil. Okay, you have to be, we have to understand that clearly. God is not the author of evil, but he allows all kinds of governments. He has allowed all kinds of governments through the ages, and he allows them for his own purpose. Like, you know, you, you bring up Nazi Germany and you think, that's just crazy. They wholesale destroyed the Jews. In the most evil way. And you know what? We don't get it. We don't, I, I, I can't say that I understand it, but I know that good came from it. What? Yeah. The nation of Israel exists because of that event. They were regathered to their homeland because of that event. And so God used it for good. He goes on, verse 2, and he says, Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. They who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. Really? Clearly, what is he saying? He's saying authority is established by God. If you resist that authority, you're resisting God. He goes on and says, Rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good and you will have praise from the same. Have you found it to be true? I mean, certainly in our culture, we get that. Like, if you've ever had any time in your life when you've been somewhat of a criminal, don't raise your hand. I'll just use my own life as an example. You guys know. Uh, there was a, a, a short, just a brief period in my life when I wasn't on the right side of the law. You know, sometime in the 80s, it was kind of a messy time for me. And I, I just, I remember... Constantly being afraid. In fact, in fact, I, I remember just as clear as day. I remember driving in my car, and a police officer was behind me, and, and I remember my knees were shaking so violently I couldn't control it. I could, I had to pull over, because I was so afraid. Because I knew if I did anything wrong, if I got pulled over, I was going to jail. I was afraid. I lived my life afraid. Why? Not because the government, in this case, was some evil, oppressive government. It's because I was bad. Because I did bad things and I disregarded the government. I wouldn't be in subject, I wouldn't be subjected to the government. And I thought, oh, I'll fight the, I'll fight the law. I'm a criminal. <laughs> Prisons are filled with people like that. It's foolishness. Now, I think, I think Paul is making general statements here. Not, not about all governments for all time. But he's just saying, listen, the government doesn't exists for evil, the government exists for good. He says, verse four, it's a minister of God for you for good. If you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, verse five, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Then he comes to verse 7, Romans 13, 7. Render to all. So you get the idea. It's the same language that Jesus is using. Render to all what is due them. Tax to whom tax is due. Custom to whom custom. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. And all of you, as we read that, you just found a little loophole, right? There's a little loophole there. Now, I'm only going to honor him because he... He's honorable. If he's not honorable, I'm not going to honor him. We like that little loophole. No, you got to honor those who are worthy of honor. It has to do more with the position than the person. Clearly, from what Paul says here, resisting authority is equivalent to resisting God. Now, there are examples in the scripture, and I think it's important to, to say this, even as we're considering whether or not it's right to pay taxes, whether or not it's right to be obedient to the government or be subservient to the government. There are examples in the scripture of what we would call righteous resistance. And some of you think, oh, that's what I want to hear about. Tell us how we can defy authority. Well, Daniel did it. 
We see it repeatedly in Daniel chapter 1. He resisted partaking of the king's choice food because he was a Jew and the Jews had strict dietary laws. Daniel felt obligated to those things by law and by conscience. And so when they came and they said, we're going to fatten you up with the king's food, the choice food, much of which would have been unclean to him, even possibly sacrificed to demons. He said, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to eat the choice food. I'm not going to drink the wine. Probably there has to do with the fact that he was maybe a Nazarite because of the Nazarite vow that some of the Jews took at times, they forbid them from drinking wine. But for whatever reason, he says, no, I'm going to eat vegetables and drink water. He resisted authority. He did it in a respectful way, but guided by conscience, he had to do it. He could do no other. And God saw it, and what did he do? He honored him. It's a righteous resistance. He resisted Nebuchadnezzar's order to bow to the image of gold in chapter 3. Now, you could say, you could stretch this and say, well, you know, paying taxes is bowing down to the, the idol of the government. Give me a break. There's a day coming when we'll have to do this, right? There's a day coming. We read about it in Revelation. There's a day coming when the Antichrist, the... Uh, the figure that will come upon the world stage, he will require absolute worship. And at that point, we will we'll have to resist. We will not bow. And we've got an example in Daniel as he was living in battle. I'm not going to bow to that false god. There's a righteous resistance. If the government comes to you and, and imposes that kind of a thing, then yeah, you have to resist. You can do no other, Right? That will be a day to resist. In chapter 6, we saw that Daniel disregarded the law forbidding him to pray to any god other than Nebuchadnezzar. We have a law on the books, I guess, or an ordinance or whatever, that you can't have prayer in the public school system. It's a joke. It, it, seriously, it's a joke. There's a, you know, kind of a meme that's out there. It's, you know, there's always prayer on test day. <laughs> you can't legislate that. You can't tell people you can't pray. How can you stop me from praying? I can pray while I'm talking to you. I don't have to close my eyes and do this. I'm talking to God all the time. You can't stop it. You can't legislate against it. But if someone comes to you and forbids you from praying to God... And so, oh, you, you can no longer do that. What are you going to do? Psh, Daniel just said, whatever. Just went up to his room and prayed. <laughs> he, he was a man of prayer, and so he did pray. It's righteous resistance. When someone comes to you and says, you can't do that, you have to obey God. We've got to righteously resist when the government tells us to be silent with the gospel. We see this in the book of Acts. As the apostles were going out, sharing the message of the gospel in Acts chapter 4 and chapter 5 and so on, they would get arrested and, you know, and be told, you guys be quiet, stop talking about Jesus. And it's like, yeah, you know, between God and man, who are we going to obey? Yeah, we're going to obey God. You should righteously resist any pressure on you to be silent with the gospel. I'm going to righteously resist. Next year, I'm going to India in January. And, you know, the government forbids proselytizing. You can't, you can't do these things. The government is a Hindu government. They want a Hindu nation. And we're going to go, and we're going to be training pastors. I'm going to be teaching. I'm going to be teaching the word of God. It's forbidden, so what? Now, I say that, that to me is like a righteous resistance, but I do it also knowing that I could get in trouble. And because I'm obeying God, I'm willing to trust him for that. And we must, as Christians, we must be willing to obey God and to do the things that he's commanded and given to us to do. And if that is righteous resistance, those are the things, right? Those are the things that we can lawfully do, that we ought to lawfully do. I'm saying lawfully before the Lord. But should we pay taxes or not pay taxes? Jesus' answer is ingenious. 
Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Render means to deliver, give back, or pay, right? And so as he is teaching this principle, he says to them, grab a denarius, bring me a denarius. Evidently, he didn't have any. He says, bring me a denarius. This was a small silver coin weighing 3.8 grams. On one side, it bore the image of the head of Caesar, and the abbreviated inscription, inscription there was Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus Augustus. On the other side was the inscription Pontifex Maximus, it's the chief priest. It was the amount paid into the Roman treasury by all adult men and women just for the privilege of existing. And it could only be paid with this particular coin. And so he says, whose likeness, whose inscription is on this? And they said, well, Caesar's. Okay. Render to Caesar that which is Caesar's. It's beautiful. It's brilliant. Ancient coins, the, in the ancient world, these coins were understood, literally, they were understood to be the property of the person whose picture and inscription was on them. The coins that they used in their commerce didn't belong to them. And they would have known that. They would have understood that. The coins were basically on loan from Caesar. They all belonged to Caesar. And so Jesus is just saying, hey, this isn't yours anyway. You've got it in your hand, but it doesn't really, it belongs to him. His name is on it. So just give it to him. If you're a Christian and you're considering these verses, I would just say it really couldn't be any clearer, could it? And you might say, well, yeah, but our government's corrupt. And I, and I don't care if you're thinking about the current administration or the previous administration or the previous administration. It doesn't really matter. We would say that, depending on what political persuasion we are. We'd say, oh, the government's corrupt. Those guys, yeah, they're, it's highway robbery. I would just say, do you think that they're any more corrupt than the Roman government of Jesus' day? Governments are always corrupt. By nature, they're corrupt. They're made of men. And probably mostly not Christian men and women. Of course they're corrupt. Just as your own heart is corrupt, we're corrupt. It's a corrupt system because it's man's system. And so to claim, oh, I don't have to pay taxes because, I don't, because the, the, the government is corrupt, because the president is corrupt, or the legislators, they're corrupt, whatever. You would just have to say, well, then how did Jesus say pay taxes? The government of his day killed him. That's corruption, right? They, they had him murdered, though he was innocent. Paul says, render to all what is due them. Tax to whom tax, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. And for you who might be of the mindset, oh, I'm going to, you know, <laughs> I'm going to get a shed out in the woods and hunker down. <laughs> Whatever, you know. Do you drive on roads that are provided by the government? Do you use the postal system? Do you use the internet? Do you like to be able to call 911 and have people respond? Those things are all provided by the government. Yes, the government's corrupt, but is the government, is the, is the intention of it evil? No. As Christians, I don't think you can escape the fact that the scripture clearly teaches we should pay taxes. You should pay tax. And not begrudgingly, you should just pay it. Now, our particular tax system is complicated, right? It's not like the, the, you know, they paid with a single coin. It was pretty easy to do. We've got forms, forms and forms and forms. It's a drag. I would say this, if you're looking for a loophole, there's nothing wrong with legally working to pay as little tax as you're supposed to, okay? 
I think, I think that's reasonable. Don't overpay. Don't pay too much and be, oh, I'll oh, just fill it out, whatever. It's, like, it's a complicated system and you should do your homework and pay as little tax as you have to. But don't make it your ambition to pay no tax because you use all these things. And it's, and it's unfortunate that we live in a world that if you're rich... You can afford all the lawyers and figure out ways to not pay any taxes. I think that's unfortunate. Personal commentary there. I think just as Christians, we have to understand that we have a responsibility to these things. Okay? It's our society. Now, here's a couple things that I would just say on a personal note by way of application. When you're making a private sale or a purchase, pay the correct tax. You guys all know the scenario. You sell a car or you buy a car. Oh, if you just fill out the, if you fill out the paperwork a little bit differently, you can pay less taxes. Don't do that. You should have a conscience in regard to those things. Don't try to get out of paying taxes through fraud. It's against the law and it's a violation of what the scripture teaches. Amen? Don't do that. And I've had it, I've had it happen where, you know, I'm selling something. The guy says, hey, you know, can we just write down, you know, Dude, I'm sorry, I can't do that. Why? Because I'm a Christian. Uh, I'm sorry, dude, you know, that's the way it is. Uh, I've got a conscience. I, I've got to do what the Lord tells me to do, not what I think. So don't try to get out of those. If you, if you, pay, if you get tips as part of your income as tips, you should report those. You, know, you don't get a pass. There's no gray area there. You might think there's a gray area, but there's not. The federal government doesn't recognize it as a gray area. You should pay taxes on those things. Is it hard work for you to do that? You got to record it and all that? You need to be able to lay your head down at night knowing that you've done the things that the Lord has required of you. Pay your taxes. I should be, I should be teaching this in March, right? March and early April. As a believer, you should never cheat on your taxes, okay? I just want to be that clear. I think it's clear from the scripture. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Just do it. And, and you've got to trust the Lord. It's an act of faith. It, you know, it, it may make more sense for you to try to, you know, fraudulently pay less. One conscience-stricken taxpayer wrote to the IRS, Dear sir, my conscience bothered me. Here's the $175 which I owe in back taxes. P.S. If my conscience still bothers me, I'll send the rest. Man, yeah, that kind of hits the nail on the head, doesn't it? That's how we are. We should do this because it's the right thing to do. We should do it because Jesus did it, because he commands it. And if you have some political philosophy of resistance, you should exchange your own personal philosophy for a biblical one, for Jesus' philosophy. Pay the tax. Now, the other side of the coin, and I would just say kind of the more important thing, it's almost like if we looked at these backwards, we would kind of get this, but he says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but to God the things that are God's. That's the other side of the coin. Render to God, give to God, pay to God, yield to God the things that are his. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to add that up. What's his? Now, thinking about the coin, right? To, to make the example of what Caesar, what does Caesar own, right? He says, show me a coin. So they brought in the coin. It's, it's got his face on it. It's got his, his inscription on it. It belongs to him. It's his. Give it to him. But the things that belong to God, give to God. Where is God's image? Look in the mirror and you'll see God's image. You are the image of God. God has made you in his own image, it says in Genesis 1.27. It says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. You're the image bearer of God. It's the, it's the most wonderful thing about all creation that God so sought to make us 
in some ways to be like him. You're autonomous. Like God, you have a will. You can do whatever you want. Do you know that? You can do what you want. Every day you choose to do things or not to do things based on your own desire as a free agent. You can do what you want. God made you that way. And I love that he made us that way. We're Americans after all. We celebrate that. I can do whatever I want. I'm a cowboy. Well, we, we do. We celebrate that. That's our national religion. He created us with the capacity to create. Like him, the creator of all things, and we look at nature, we look at all the wonderful things that he did and you know, has made, and every discovery is like more amazing than the last. And then we look at what we do. We create. We make things. We build things. We build crazy cool things like the new iPhone that I want to get. I mean, seriously, we just keep creating new things and bigger things. I took a look at this plane that I'm going to fly on. It's the biggest plane I've ever seen. I was, I was, you know, trying to already get my seat for my trip in January, and I'm going to be on one of those planes that has the double-decker. It's like I was, it's like how many hundreds of people are on this thing? It's crazy. It's like a giant, massive thing, and like the whole upstairs is all those rich people's seats that recline. It's like, ah. Oh. Anyway, it's like, but we created that. It hurls through the air hundreds of miles an hour carrying all these people who are uncomfortable eating their snack-sized peanuts or whatever. But it's like we're creative. We create things, art and music. It's the image of God. He created this with the capacity to love. The next time you feel the sense of love towards one another, recognize that that came from God. He built that into you. And you know what? He didn't build it into the cows and the cats and the dogs. It's not love like the love that God gave to us. Render. Render, Paul says, what is due them. Tax to whom taxes due. Custom to whom custom. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. Most people would never, ever consider not paying taxes due the government. Right? I mean, sure, we may. It may be in our hearts to fudge a little bit and try to cut some corners and cheat a little bit. But for the most part, we're paying our taxes because we don't want to go to prison, right? Isn't it interesting that those of us who would be law-abiding citizens and say, yeah, of course I'm paying my taxes. Of course, I'm going to get it in the mail by... April 15th, maybe at the last minute, but I'm going to pay it. And we would say, of course I'm going to do that because I'm a good citizen. Some of us who would stand on that principle and agree with that principle give nothing to God. Let that sink in for a minute. He says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. It's like, okay, yeah, I'm a citizen here. I'll, I'll write out the check, I'll pay. But then when it comes to God... What is he saying? He's saying, render to God the things that are God's. What's God's? Everything. But then for some reason, we decide, ah, you know, what's the least I can possibly give whom I owe everything to? Now, and I'm not talking about money. Of course, the tax is, has to do with money. But if the government is rightly due a percentage, what percentage is God due? What percentage of you as a human being is due God? Hopefully, you understand that that's a rhetorical question. And the answer is obvious, everything. Everything is due our God. I would just say this. Have you given yourself to God? Have you rendered to God the things that are due him? Have you rendered yourself to him? Do you belong to him? If you're here today and you're not a Christian, it's do him. He's the God of the universe. He created you. He loves you. He wants a reciprocal, a responding love where we would just say, God, I recognize you. I want to have a relationship with you. It's right. It's reasonable. Not only do we belong to God because we're his image bearers, he's got the mark on us of his own ownership. 
This morning, we're going to take communion. And I think the whole reminder of communion is not only that God created us and loves us and has made us special and all of that, where the object of his affection, but then in Christ, there's the idea that he bought us with his own blood. He made us, we rightly belong to him, but then because of sin, he had to purchase us back. It's like we doubly belong to him. And not just a little, everything. Paul talks about this in Acts chapter 20. He, in his preaching, he says, the church of God, which is us as believers, which he purchased with his own blood. We belong to him by birth and by rebirth. Malachi the prophet, he said that the people of God were robbing God by withholding tithes and offerings. Now that had to do with the legal obligation of the Jews. They were obligated to give to God and they hadn't been. He says, you're robbing God. How much more the children of God who are redeemed when we withhold our own lives from God? It could be said that, that for a lot of our lives, we're ripping him off. We're robbing what is due him. In 2 Chronicles chapter 16, it says, the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. I love that verse. And look at what it says. It says God's looking throughout the whole earth. It's like God, it's like, He's looking, and what is he looking for? He's looking for someone whose heart is not 10% his or half his, 75% his, but all his. Is that you? Is that me? I don't want to be partially God's. I don't want to have a portion. Hey, you know what? I'm the Lord's on Sunday morning. Right? I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not the Lord's here in this environment. I'm the Lord's on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. He says, render to God the things that are God's. Proverbs 23, 26 says, give me your heart, my son, and let your eyes delight in my ways. Give me your heart, son, daughter. Give it to me. I think that, that's what God's after. He's not after your money in the sense that's not his goal. God doesn't care about that stuff. He's after your heart. And if he'll get a hold of your heart, everything else follows, doesn't it? It's like this thing of obedience to the government. If you're submitted to God first, then it's no thing to obey the laws. It's not, it's not a big thing. You're, you're naturally a good citizen if you're a Christian. If only the government would realize that, you know, the, the sense of the government that would want to put restrictions on churches or on the proclamation of the gospel, if they only got the spiritual reality that Christians make the best citizens, right? If they only got that. When God gets a hold of our hearts, we are the best citizens because we belong to him. Render to God, surrender to God. Have you surrendered your hands? Do your hands belong to God? Are they, are they useful for his purposes? Will you do what he asks? Have you surrendered your lips? Oh, people say, oh, I can do anything, but I can't. Don't, I'm not too shy. I don't, I'm not really. That was Moses' argument, remember? Moses said, uh, you know, send somebody that's smarter than me. They can talk better than me. Do you know the Lord wants to use your lips, your mouth, to proclaim the gospel? He's chosen to use our lips, our mouth, the things that as we're born again, as we belong to Jesus Christ, as we're surrendered to him, he wants to use you and I to communicate the gospel. Not me, it's not my job. People sometimes think that, oh, the pastor, he'll be the evangelist. No, you're the evangelist. If your lips are surrendered, my job is to equip you to do that, to to teach you, to remind you what the gospel is, but your job is to go have free lips to do it. Will you say what God says? Have you surrendered your feet? Will you go where God leads? Or have you planted your feet? I'm going here. That's the only place I'm going, and God can't make me go anywhere else. Right? There's that old classic thing. Of, well, I was afraid if I did that, God would send me to Africa. 
So what? If he wants to send you to Africa, go. It'd be cool. It'd be an adventure. <gasps> but I'm, I'm afraid of adventure. Okay. Stay home. <coughs> Die of old age doing nothing. Or go where he sends you. Be surrendered. If we're going to fulfill the command of Jesus to render unto God the things that are God, we must say yes to every one of these things. And I would just say no holding back. No holding back. You can't, you can't say, oh, I'm going to render to God everything, but then no. At the same time, it doesn't work that way. We're going to have communion. Let's have the band come up. And they're going to lead us in a, a, a sweet, sweet song that I think really fits in uh, to this whole thing thematically. I want to remind you, though, as we, as we come to the table, Paul gave, in 1 Corinthians 11, he gave some kind of warnings in how to receive communion, how to take communion. And this is one of the things that he said in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight. He said, a man, woman there is implied, you know, people, must examine himself and in so doing he's to eat of the bread and drink of the cup and that's kind of where i hope you feel pushed or i've wanted to bring you at least is to a place of self-examination maybe the lord showed you in some way you're being totally disobedient to the scriptures maybe you're a tax cheat maybe you're a fraud repent you should repent of that or maybe you're the Christian who's been a Christian for a long time, but I'm not doing that. The Lord's not going to use my hands. I go to church on Sundays, but I'm not doing anything else. I'm not going to open my mouth on the job. That could get me in trouble. I would say, repent of that. That's not a biblical attitude. The Lord wants to use your hands. He wants to use your mouth. If he doesn't use your mouth, who's is he going to use? Who's going to communicate, communicate the gospel in the place where you are? And perhaps you've resisted where he wants to send you. I don't know where that is. It could be across the street, across the aisle in your cubicle. Don't resist him. Render yourself to him. It's right. And so examine your heart. And wherever there's something in your heart or something in your behavior that doesn't line up with Scripture, Scripture is not wrong. Right? You can't say, hey, you know that thing that you said this morning about Jesus and taxes? I don't believe in that. So what? God doesn't care what you believe or don't believe. It's not your philosophy because you don't belong to yourself. You belong to Him. Repent of whatever philosophy you're holding on to. Maybe you're, well, I just hate the government because of this or that. So what? Governments come and go. Render to God the things that are God's. Father, thank you for your word. And we pray, Lord, as we, uh, as we sing this song, as we prepare to take the communion, we think about what you did for us. Lord, you didn't have to pay taxes, but you did. You didn't have to come and put up with the abuse, but you did. You didn't have to surrender yourself to the cross, but you did. And you did it because you loved us, because you wanted to purchase us back from sin and death. Lord, we want to respond to you and say thank you. We want to repent of the things that need to be repented of. Lord, forgive us, cleanse our hearts. Take away our evil thoughts, our rebellion, the stubbornness that's within us. May we be pliable. May we be yielded to you. May we say yes and amen, Lord. We'll do whatever you want. We'll be your hands. We'll be your feet. We'll be your spokesperson. What an honor it is, Lord, that you would desire to use us in our day. Oh, that you would. We want to receive your grace your mercy today.